The FDA expected to announce new standards for approving a coronavirus vaccine. Additionally, trials will have to show evidence surrounding more severe cases in older people, making it unlikely a vaccine will be finished before the presidential election. I'm joined by epidemiologist Dr. Jonathan Cantor from the Penn Center for Epidemiology. Good morning. So it is no secret the American public has become skeptical and worried that politics is coming before science. So do you see this as a move to shore up that public confidence? Well, I think there's no question that, you know, these recent moves that we're seeing now are designed explicitly to improve public confidence. The vaccine situation obviously has sort of been one of those uh, you know, kind of classic situations, unfortunately, that we've been dealing with this with, with the pandemic, where we take a nugget of a problem, that problem is then expanded, and then ten, things tend to snowball. And I think we've been seeing that a lot in terms of the vaccine. Uh, I think a lot of the comments on both sides of the aisle have really inflamed things a little bit and have been making the American public, again, regardless of people, whether people identify themselves as liberal or conservative, has really been increasing their level of skepticism about the safety of a vaccine. So I think it's definitely been necessary and helpful to really try to do these public displays to show, listen, the scientists are in charge and it is the scientists who are ultimately going to be the ones who make the decisions regarding the safety and efficacy of a vaccine. That's what Stephen Hahn said yesterday. But it's also interesting to note that the clinical trials haven't included children. So vaccines for our kids may not arrive, they're saying, until the next school year. So in terms of reigning in the pandemic and with the kids in the classroom now, how does that play? Well, I think that is really kind of one of the major elephants in the room that we're dealing with here. You know, there's no vaccine in the, in the works for kids. There are no trials that are currently enrolling children. Uh, there are no uh, large scale vaccine studies right now that are looking at kids at all. In fact, all the studies explicitly only have inclusion criteria that allow people over the age of 18. And again, part of that makes sense because, listen, for the most part, people have been worried about the effects, the mortality of people dying of COVID, which is disproportionately happening in older people. The problem is, as you're alluding to, Bruce, the kids, first of all, kids can get very sick, kids can die, and kids can have long-term consequences and sequela from it, number one. Number two, kids really will serve to continue to spread the vaccine until there's an effective vaccine in place that's available for them. So the fact that we don't even have a vaccine in the works and that we're looking at you know, a time course of, you know, it would be, I'd be shocked if we have a children, a pediatric vaccine approved, certainly for the youngest uh, group of kids by the time the next school year comes around. So that's going to be a major concern going forward as we try to really rein in the pandemic and really limit the effect it has on our economy and our lives. And I have to ask you about the chaos at the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention over revised guidance on the spread of COVID-19. So the CDC suddenly went back to previous guidance about how the coronavirus is transmitted, ditching language about airborne transmission that it had posted on its website only a few days earlier. Can you kind of sort that out for us? Yeah, I mean, the thing to keep in mind here is that this has there is a kind of a context here that stretches back months. I mean, back in July, there was an open letter by a group of scientists complaining to the WHO, to the World Health Organization, that they hadn't acknowledged the possibility of airborne transmission. Finally, the WHO reversed course and said, well, it is possible that there's going to be airborne transmission. In response to that, the CDC had not yet changed its own guidelines where it talks about respiratory droplet spread. I think the key takeaway, though, regardless of kind of the, uh, the back and forth that we're seeing here, is that for the American people to think about what is going on here, the real issue is this. Respiratory droplet spread means basically that the virus is going to spread typically with larger droplets. So the fact that you were in a room beforehand, for example, if somebody comes in five minutes later, they would be very, very unlikely to get something that spreads by respiratory droplets. Those would have fallen to the ground. If airborne spread is a possibility, again, it depends on the size of the airborne particles, but one could argue that you could have airborne particles that essentially are still floating around. And that has important implications in terms of reopening. It has important implications in terms of businesses opening, in terms of airline flights and things like that. And that's why this is such a contentious issue and people really want to make sure they sort out the science. And I think we need to sort out the science rather than try to sort out the politics, which unfortunately, again, is encroaching into the issue. So we know for sure about the six feet, but we're unsure beyond that, so better safe than sorry. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I would always err on the side of caution myself. I mean, I, I think from the beginning, I have treated 
uh, SARS-CoV-2. I have treated the coronavirus uh, as if it were potentially airborne. I think when you don't know for sure, you always want to err on the side of caution. Anything you can do to be extra protective, that's great. But again, we also all have to be able to get along with our lives. And that's where we have to work out those individual risk benefit calculations that are so important for ourselves and our families and our communities. That's, you know, the reality now. We've got to find what our new normal is and try and get on with our lives. Dr. Jonathan Cantor, always a pleasure. Appreciate you. 745.